Coming up on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour, we're talking about trapping antimatter with Dr. Joel Fagens from UC Berkeley. That's up next on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Dr. Kiki's Science Hour with me, Dr. Kiki Sanford, episode 111, recorded on Thursday, September 1st, 2011. Antimatter Matters. This episode of Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All streamed directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com forward slash twit. Hi, everybody. This is Dr. Kiki, and welcome to Dr. Kiki Science Hour. We're in episode 111, and I hope you are ready to dig in, to get dirty, because we are spending the entire hour, you know how it goes, one hour, one subject, one expert on the topic of trapping antimatter. That's right. Why and how are scientists working to trap it? We're joined by Dr. Joel Fagens from UC Berkeley to talk about this topic today. But first, a few science headlines as usual. First up, scientists dredged up bodies from mass graves in London to take a look at the Black Death. They found that the bacterial cause of widespread death across Europe was Yersinia pestis, a bacterium still known to cause disease around the world. However, the DNA of the ancestral version of the bacteria has some differences from modern Y. pestis, which might explain why the Black Death was as lethal as it was. But they don't know yet, so more research is necessary. So a microsurgeon and an engineer walk into a bar. It could be the beginning of a joke, but not really. In truth, a microsurgeon and an engineer from Stanford University created a new method for suturing blood vessels, which might improve outcomes for cardiovascular vascular surgery, as well as reattaching limbs. It relies on a polymer called Poloaxmer 407 that becomes solid when heated above body temperature. So, so it can hold the lumen of blood vessels open as surgeons apply glue to seal the two cut ends together. Then the polymer dissolves into the blood when it is allowed to return to body temperature, leaving no trace. Rats whose aortas had been used to test the polymer had no complications for up to two years following the procedure. Additionally, the procedure works on vessels as small as 0.2 millimeters in diameter. Canadian researchers unearthed 30,000-year-old bacteria preserved in the permafrost and found that genes for antibiotic resistance existed long before modern medicine hit the scene. This flies in the face of the idea that resistance genes came from the clinical use of antibiotics. A study published in the journal Molecular Psychiatry might be good news to soldiers deployed to combat zones. When returning from deployment, soldiers' amygdalas showed heightened sensitivity to angry and fearful faces, but the effect returned to normal after 18 months, suggesting that the effects of combat to the functioning of the brain might not be permanent. However, the prefrontal cortex, which controls amygdala function, did not change over the observation period. As an important first, scientists showed that a modified virus could be safely used to target cancerous tumors throughout the body. Using modified vaccinia virus, which is used to vaccinate people against smallpox, the researchers reported that replicating virus was actually found in the tumors of seven out of the eight patients receiving the highest viral dose. But it wasn't in any healthy tissue, which is a great point. And infection with the virus temporarily prevented tumor growth in six of the patients. This is not not a cure for cancer, but an important step to developing cancer-killing viral treatments. Yale researchers found that signals from stem cells in the scalp's fatty layer stimulate hair growth in mice. So with this study, we can rest assured that we are one step closer to curing baldness in mice. 
Want to see a supernova? Train your telescopes, binoculars, and eyes on the constellation Ursa Major, a classic Type 1A supernova called PTF 11 KLY was detected by the Palomar Transient Factory Survey at Palomar Observatory in Southern California, flaring up on August 23rd in the Pinwheel Galaxy, only 21 million light years away. Planetologists discovered that drier planets might be better for life. Computer simulations created by researchers at NASA, Ames, and the University of Tokyo suggest that land planets have habitable zones three times larger than water planets. So the planet Arrakis on the dune in the dune series might be similar to the first inhabited planet that we find. Chinese scientists want to nudge a passing metallic asteroid so that it starts orbiting the Earth at about twice the distance of the Earth to the moon. The purpose? A sci-fi movie? Nope. In actuality, it's to show that it's possible and to mine it for its precious metals, of course. Finally, pre preliminary results from a detector called the LHCB, specifically designed to test predictions made by the standard model of physics, such as the decay of bottom quarks and B mesons, look pretty good for the standard model. Data presented at a recent meeting don't deviate significantly from standard model predictions, which, if you are a fan of so-called new physics ideas like supersymmetry, might not be such good news to you, as the results so far don't support new physics. I'd like to thank Netflix for sponsoring this hour of Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. Netflix streams thousands of TV episodes and movies directly to you instantly, which means you save time, money, and hassle. There are several easy ways to instantly access streaming movies and TV shows with Netflix. You can watch Netflix movies and TV shows on your Mac, your PC, your iPad, your iPhone, even your Android phones. If you don't have one of those things but have a gaming console because you're into gaming, you can use an Xbox 360, PS3, or a Nintendo Wii and watch Netflix right on your TV. If you're not a gamer, you can still watch Netflix using a set-top box like a Roku or an Apple TV box. Box. They're inexpensive and easy to use. With Netflix, you can watch new movies and TV shows instantly using any of these devices, and you can begin watching a movie or a show on one device and then finish it on a completely different device, making you and your TV watching habits extremely portable. Whichever way you choose to access Netflix, you can watch as many movies and TV shows as you want anytime that you want, and you can cancel at any time. So try Netflix today for 30 days free. Go to netflix.com forward slash twit. And be sure to use this URL when you sign up for your free trial. That's netflix, N-E-T-F-L-I-X dot com forward slash twit. We thank, ne thank Netflix for their support of twit and hope that you enjoy watching instantly with Netflix. So now let's get into the show Back to what we were originally going to talk about for the hour, antimatter. Our guest for the show, Dr. Joel Fagens, received his undergraduate degree in physics and electrical engineering from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 1980. He stayed at MIT for his doctoral degree on free electron lasers. Then he moved to the University of California at San Diego for postdoc studies on non-neutral plasmas. And in 1986, he joined the faculty of UC Berkeley, where he is now and currently a professor of physics. His research concentrates on non-neutral plasma physics, two-dimensional fluid dynamics, and non-linear dynamics. In 2003, he joined the newly formed Alpha Collaboration at CERN, which studies the trapping and properties of anti-hydrogen. Joel, thank you very much for joining me today. You're very welcome. How did you get involved in alpha and studying antimatter and anti-hydrogen, moving from your interest in plasmas to stuff that annihilates when it comes in contact with matter? Well, like many things, it was serendipitous. I, I was at a conference and I heard a talk by somebody and they were talking about uh, their plans to make an anti-hydrogen trap. And uh, they were planning to use the, the sorts of plasmas that I was familiar with and they thought that they would be able to use a particular magnetic field configuration, something called a quadrupole magnet. And I heard that and I said, thought that um, this didn't seem like it was going to work to me. And um, <laughs> anyway, at the next coffee break, I 
ran into one of my graduate students and said, I have a thesis project for you. And sure enough, <laughs> that's what his thesis project was, was showing that, that it, it, it had a, th this proposed method had its problems. And along the way, we came up with a, a small modification to the way um, it had been proposed originally to use a slightly different type of magnetic field than the magnetic field that had been proposed. And uh, we wrote some papers about that and uh, eventually did some research here at Berkeley on, on this sort of thing. And that's uh, magnetic field configuration came to the attention of an, the newly forming alpha collaboration and they wanted to use it and I, that's how I got involved. Why is a magnetic field thought to be one of the, uh, thought to be the, the way to trap antimatter? Well, as you mentioned uh, in your introduction, antimatter and matter annihilate when they touch each other. They're incompatible with each other. So if uh, some antimatter touches matter, they blow up. Annihilation is just a fancy physics word for things that something blowing up. And they blow up in, in a remarkably energetic way. In fact, all of the matter all of the all of the mass in the antimatter and the piece of matter that it happens to touch disappear and turn into energy via Einstein's famous equation e equals mc squared. This is the only reaction we actually know where all of the mass turns into energy. If you do a fission mm -hmm. reaction, for instance, with uranium, um, you wind up with fission byproducts. Only a small amount of the mass in the uranium turns into energy. But when you do it with matter and antimatter, it all goes into energy. So antimatter as a fuel, if it was possible to make a fuel out of antimatter, when it's really not for reasons we can get into, but if it was possible to make a fuel from antimatter, it would be the most energetic fuel uh, known. In, in fact, it would be the most energetic fuel possible because everything gets used up and turned into energy. Right. So... so so, so in comparison to, say, a, a barrel of crude oil, the uh, you need a much, much, much smaller quantity of of matter and antimatter to be able to to power a vehicle, which is why science fiction authors and and people are such fans of the idea for interstellar travel. Is that correct? That's right. I I could basically take over the world with a barrel of antimatter. Uh, <laughs> that I, sounds like an it, evil scientist thing to say. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Um, no, um, <laughs> you could you could get to the stars if you had a amount of antimatter the size of my thumb, more or less. You could make a rocket ship that would get to the stars because there's so much the it, the energy density is so so high, um, which would be great. I mean, it would be great to be able to make a probe that would get to the stars in a, in a reasonably short amount of time. And, if you want to send people to the stars, you'd need a little bit more, maybe the size of my fist or a couple of fists or something like that. So it would have some great applications, but it's not going to happen because it's, ener it's simply impossible energetically to make a significant quantity of antimatter. But to come back to one of your question, why do we need magnetic fields? Um, if you want to have antimatter, you want to put it in a bottle, right? And right. um, how do you make a bottle that has no sides? Because if you pour water into a bottle, of course, the water just goes and touches the sides. But if you pour antimatter into a bottle, the, the antimatter would go off and touch the sides. So, um, and then you'd have an explosion. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. It, you'd have an explosion and it would annihilate, and that would be the end of the antimatter and the end of your bottle, assuming you actually poured a significant amount in. So we have to figure out how to make a bottle that has no sides. And that, that's a, that's a tr tough trick. But fortunately, um, it can be done, and it can be done using magnetic fields. And maybe this would, since um, you, you brought it up, I, I sent along a video that we could watch and see how the magnetic fields actually do this. Do, is it, would this be a good time to play the video? Sure. Colin, do you have that video ready? Colin. <laughs> yes, great. Okay. So if you could stop it for a second, there's sound on this video. Maybe you could 
turn off the sound and I'll just give you running commentary as we go along. It's hard to see, so you have to look. Um, if, if It's running at the moment, but if you could stop it. Um, it's hard to see, but you can see there's a glass sphere there. Yeah, you can see kind of a ref uh, what looks like a, a, a light reflection. Yeah, a bunch of points, and, and actually you can just barely make out that there's a glass sphere. And in the center mm -hmm. of that glass sphere, there's a green pencil, which is actually a beam of electrons. Those electrons are starting out from an electron source, which is actually glowing, the thing that's glowing orange, which you can barely see one orange spot in the picture, right? Mm -hmm. it, and that beam of electrons is leaving that orange spot and going out and hitting the, hitting the side of this glass container. You can, normally you can't see electrons all that easily, but in this case, there's enough gas in the glass container that as the electron beam passes by, it ionizes the gas and you can use that to see where the electron beam is going. And is, this would, it, I'm sorry? I was gonna say, is there a specific gas that's, uh, that's better for doing that than another? You know, uh, he, here, I, I warned you, you were going to stump me many times in this conversation. <laughs> okay. For the first time and not the last. Um, it, it's basically like a neon, a neon bulb that, you know, it could be a core sign or something like that. It's, they work on more or less the same principle. Right. So if we could go back to that image for a sec, for a minute. Um, so surrounding this glass sphere, you really have to use your imagination to see it. There are some magnetic field coils. Okay. And if we could that, that make a magnetic field that points through the glass sphere. And if we could run the video again, um, nothing's going to happen for a bit, and this isn't as well clipped as perhaps it should be. But eventually, we're going to start turning on the magnet. I started to turn on the magnetic field, and when I do that, which should happen any moment now, so I can we'll see just... reflections of your. There's your hand. Yeah. The oh, electrons okay. are see? moving. They're they bent in a circle. Yes. You see that? Yes. They made a nice nice loop, and that's. It. Oh, that's the can end of the video. Show, Let's do that over. Of, yeah, I, in fact, if you want, you can backtrack a little bit and just show what happens as the as this magnetic field is turned on. But what happens is that the magnetic field bends the particles, the electrons. So rather than hitting the glass side, you can bend them into a circle so they basically come back to where they are. So now they're going in a loop and they're not touching the sides. So if these were antimatter electrons, which are actually called positrons, mm -hmm. those antimatter electrons would now no longer annihilate. Um, as right, they because hit. they never actually come into contact with the, the glass sphere or technically the sides of your bottle. They're being, yeah. the magnetic field is condensing them or just forcing them into a, 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 a different configuration. Well, it just bends them in a circle. Um, so it's a beam and it wants to go off to the side, something like mm -hmm. that. But because it's a beam, that beam, um, when you send elect, when you send moving charges through a magnetic field, that those moving charges get deflected, they get bent mm -hmm. by the magnetic field. And if the magnetic field is strong enough, it just bends them back in a circle and they come right back to where they started. So what we can do is we can make a bottle by using magnetic and in some cases electric fields as well which whenever a charged positron or an antiproton tries to leave the trap it gets turned around turned around and it just goes right back into the center so it can't leave now of course we also have to get rid of the gas right you saw this nice glowing uh green circle, which was from the gas that we had put inside the cylinder so that we could visualize where the beam was going. But that yeah. would annihilate the beam too. So another Right, because the gas is still matter. That's right. Um, so another requirement is that we absolutely have to get rid of as much gas as possible. We have to make a really, really good vacuum to keep the antimatter around for a substantial length of time. So 
that's the secret to, to making um, – well, that's one of the secrets anyway to, to making a bottle that has no sides. You have to use – you have to use magnetic fields and electric fields to do it. Things that don't have any, no material sides will work. Unless, of course, you made a bottle out of antimatter glass, but that would have its own problems. Right. That would be that would be its own difficulty because then, even though it's antimatter glass, it would still maybe come in contact with air in the matter-filled world. So let's go back to the kind of the the basics of of matter versus antimatter for people who might not be familiar with the concept. Um, sure. I'm, uh, probably a lot of people in my audience are familiar, but um, we live in a matter filled filled world. What is what's this antimatter stuff? Well, actually, this is great because it goes back to Ben Franklin, who's certainly every thinking person's favorite founding father. All right. That's a scientist's point of view, obviously. Uh -huh. I guess Tom Je Thomas Jefferson is in the running for that too. Um, so let, let I, but anyway, Benjamin Franklin was the first person to realize that that um, there were two types of charges in the world, charges that were became known to be well, became called positive charges and negative charges, and. Now we've identified negative charges are electrons and positive charges are protons. And then if you add neutrons into that mix, you get everything we need to build up the periodic table and essentially everything we need to make all of all of all the elements, um, you know, from hydrogen, helium. They're just combinations of more and more electrons, protons and neutrons. Right. And that's where people that's where people uh, thought the subject ended for a while. And um, then, uh, but that's actually not, not where the story ended because um, somebody made a prediction that uh, you, there actually would be negative electrons I'm sorry positive electrons and um, this is just a theoretical prediction it came out of some mathematics um, in the in the theory of quantum electrodynamics actually and perhaps people took it seriously perhaps they didn't but then Carl Anderson went and tried who was a physicist American physicist working at Caltech went and tried to to measure particles and cosmic rays and much to his uh, delight I'm sure he discovered that there were particles that looked exactly like electrons as far as he could tell but they were electrons that had a positive charge and they were coming out of cosmic rays so he for instance flew balloon flights up into the upper atmosphere and looked at the sh some of the particles and the shower of particles that um, come down and discovered that some of them bent the wrong way because they had the wrong charge. They were positively charged rather than <laughs> negatively charged. So Anderson was the discoverer of anti, uh, um, the first discoverer of antimatter, namely positrons. And once people got the idea that there were positive electrons, they got began to think that maybe there are negative an, uh, protons, right. antiprotons. And indeed, it turned out that there were. They were discovered here in Berkeley at an accelerator called the Bevatron uh, in a collaboration that was led by two famous Berkeley physicists, uh, Sid Gray and Chamberlain. And basically, actually, the Bevatron was almost built to see if this, this, uh, these particles existed. And they found that if you accelerated particles up to a few, few GeV, then if you accelerated protons and collided the protons into a target, then a few of these mysterious antiprotons would come back out. And now that we knew that there were positrons and antiprotons, people started thinking about where they might actually, I mean, what, was it, why, why did they show up in cosmic rays and did you need big accelerators like the Bevatron to make an antiproton? And about that, you know, some years later, the theory of the Big Bang was developed mm -hmm. and you know what the big bang is right that the universe started in a point of energy 
and we, we, we don't discuss what might have happened before that point of energy was formed because uh, we have well, some it. people like to but <laughs> yeah sensible people don't because it's hard enough to understand the Big Bang let alone what, yeah. what might have been before the Big Bang but in the Big Bang um, energy got turned into matter and but there's a sticky part the Big Bang is a wildly successful theory you know it, it mm -hmm. predicts all sorts of wonderful things and correctly as far as we can tell about how we came to be here, how, how first, um, you know, particles were formed and they condensed down into stars and these stars eventually started burning and eventually some of them became supernova, which made heavy elements. And all of that is, is wildly successful. But there's one problem with the theory of the Big Bang that nobody has quite figured out what it is. And that, that's that the Big Bang should have made just as much just as many much antimatter as it made matter. And why do we know that? Or why do we think that? Well, physicists like symmetry properties. And right. one, of the, one of the big symmetry properties is that something called charge conservation. You start out with something that doesn't have charge, for instance. If you take two laser beams and shoot them out at each other, if they're sufficiently powerful, just out of, the, out of these laser beams, just out of the energy in the laser beam, you can make matter. You can use mm -hmm. Einstein's equation backwards. Right. So normally we think of taking mass and turning it into energy, but you can also take energy and turn it back into mass. And so if you shine two bright enough laser beams at each other, in principle anyway, out of the vacuum, suddenly particles will start to pop. Typically, for instance, um, electrons and positrons would start to pop out. Has anybody done that? Is that do you know if that's something that uh, that's that's been achieved in a laboratory setting? Powerful yeah, lasers creating it, it gets particles. a little bit complicated here because it's certainly been done in the presence of other matter. Mm -hmm. Which it facilitates it acts sort of like a catalyst. And I ought to right. know I don't know if the raw experiment of shooting two um, laser beams at each other has ever been done in a in a complete vacuum right and got positrons and electrons to come out of it but the key thing here is charge conservation mm -hmm. the laser beams have no charge and one of the, the really deeply things we really deeply believe is that you can't just invent charge you can't suddenly just have some positive charge what you can do what you can do is to take something and make both positive and neg negative charge, equal amounts of positive and negative charge. Okay. Because that doesn't violate charge conservation. Because, because it's still technically neutral. Well, it's not neutral, but take it, I mean, each particle isn't neutral, but taken together, you right. haven't violated neutrality. Right. Okay. So if you do that, then you can you can make particles out of energy but notice that we got one positive particle and one negative particle when we did this right yeah so um that means that if 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 there were we made an electron we had to have made a positron and likewise if we make a proton we have to have made an anti-proton as well so one of the big mysteries in the world is if the Big Bang made equal quantities of, if you believe this theory, the Big Bang made equal quantities of matter and antimatter. So where did all the antimatter go? Because astronomers tell us that there isn't a lot of antimatter in the universe. Now you might ask, how do we know that there isn't a lot of antimatter in the universe? And there's a couple of ways we can, we can look for antimatter. For instance, we can look for antimatter in cosmic rays, mm -hmm. notwithstanding that Carl Anderson discovered positrons in cosmic rays. Those positrons were actually locally created. Um, and actually, let's take a little sidetrack because there was a really neat result from NASA only in the last year where NASA discovered that there was enough energy in lightning bolts to make oh, possible. Right. So 
this is, of course, in the presence of matter, right? These lightning bolts are happening in the atmosphere. So there's other matter around to facilitate the process. But this is an example, a really cool example of making antimatter, right, making stuff from energy, the energy in, in the lightning bolts. And they made, an, made positrons and electrons. Of course, we wouldn't notice the electrons because there's nothing special about them. They just sort of, who knows where they went. But the <laughs> But the positrons wound up in the, in the Van Allen belts, and they were able to detect them there. So this is something that people had thought might be going on for a while, but it was a real tour de force of an experiment to actually detect these positrons um, bouncing back in, and forth in the, the, um, in the Van Allen belts. Yeah, that seems like a really interesting uh, structure to me, the fact that there would be these belts of antimatter around the planet within our uh, magnetosphere is it um uh, is it basically the the magnetic field of our planet that's holding them in that in those structures do we have any idea why they why the belts have formed well we we certainly know why the belts are there um and it's it's exactly the same way it, the way we can find mm -hmm. our our um antimatter because there are magnetic fields there. Mm -hmm. And the particles, the, the Van Allen belts are caused by particles following field lines. If you have a magnetic field, under some circumstances, if you send a particle into that magnetic field, it will tend to follow the magnetic field lines. And of course, the Earth is a big magnet. Yeah. And so you put some particles out there and the particles tend to spiral around. Actually, they go in a helix around the magnetic mm -hmm. field lines. And then they, they go from one pole to the other pole, say from the South Pole up towards the North Pole, where the field starts to increase. Because near the pole, you've all, you remember what the field pattern from a magnet looks like, right? Um, near a pole of a magnet, the field is stronger than further away from the pole of the magnet. You've seen this mm -hmm. with iron filings in a bar magnet, I'm sure. Yeah. The, so the field increases there. And it turns out, that if you have a particle which is following a magnetic field line and you take make that magnetic field stronger and stronger, that under many circumstances the particle will bounce. So it comes in and it hits the pole and then it bounces because the magnetic field is stronger there and then goes back and heads back down to the other pole where the magnetic field is of course increasing again. So it right. bounces there and that's how these positrons were trapped. They would bounce from one pole to the other, back and forth, and they'd be mirrored, is the expression that we use at each of the poles by the increasing magnetic field that's present there. So there are many, many particles trapped in the Van Allen belts. Um, what was remarkable is that they found these positrons that came from the lightning yeah. uh, in, the, in there. But um, back, to the, back to where we, what we were talking about is is where, why do we know there's not a lot of antimatter in the universe or, or believe anyway that there's not a lot of antimatter in the universe? It's because, for one thing, um, we can study the particles in the cosmic rays, okay? And um, there, there's two, two types of particles that you could say are in the cosmic rays. One type is relatively less interesting. Uh, when the cosmic rays, which are typically, say, an energetic proton, comes and hits our upper atmosphere, it starts encountering molecules up there, say, an oxygen molecule. Uh, and occasionally this cosmic ray, which came from far away, hits a nucleus. And when it hits a nucleus, it makes a shower of other particles that come descend down there. It basically splits that nucleus into many, many particles. And each of those particles itself are very, very energetic. So mm -hmm. each of the particles that start out in this original shower, they tend to hit another, mo another nucleus and they make another shower, shower. And again and again, this process happens. So you start out with one particle, you get 10 or two or whatever. The first time it hits a nucleus, each one of those 10 or two will hit another nucleus and get you 10. And by the time you're all done at the, down at ground level, there could be millions of particles that 
are the sort of descendants of that one particle that came in. And this is neat. We mm -hmm. physicists study this process all the time. And it's always going on. They're, the most common particle in these cosmic ray showers, um, the most common inter exotic particle is something called a muon. Do you, have you ever heard of muons? They're, yeah. they're, like, they're like electrons, except they're heavy. And they also don't live forever. They eventually turn back into an electron. Uh, That's fascinating. <laughs> but um, as you sit, as all of us sit here in our chairs or wherever you're sitting, there are something like 100 muons per second going through you from these cosmic ray showers. There's so many muons being created in the upper atmosphere that uh, they make this shower of stuff that comes in and comes through us all the time. And most of the time, it doesn't hurt us in any way. Every now and then, maybe it does. But most of the time, these particles are pretty harmless. Some of them even stop inside of our body and turn back into electrons. Most of them are just going to pass right through. Okay, so these are the descendants. And at some level, these are the less interesting cosmic ray particles. The more interesting cosmic ray particles, perhaps, are the ones that actually initiate the process, these protons that come with very, very high energy and hit our upper atmosphere. And you might think most of them come from nearby, like the sun or even the Milky Way. But there's a fair amount of evidence that they don't come from nearby. They come from very far away. So they're good measure of what's out there. And we don't see very many, not much of them, very few of them are antimatter par, um, particles. They're mostly matter particles. So it's like blowing from every corner of the universe. There's this cosmic wind that comes at us, and we can sample it by taking a look. And it's a, um, since we only see basically only see matter coming at us, uh, we can conclude that these galaxies which are very very far away have to be made out of matter otherwise we would see in this wind of particles we would see antimatter particles and and we just don't though nasa just put up a, a n another experiment to try and study this and make this do this measurement of the amount of ma antimatter that's out there um, to actually pin it down to to, to well, know yeah well i mean we already know that there's not a lot but nasa this new satellite will tell us just how little antimatter there is. So that's one way we yeah. can tell. There are other ways we could tell because if you have two galaxies, uh, there's always what you might call a front between two galaxies. There are particles, these cosmic ray particles that leave the two galaxies and they come together and they make a front, kind of like a weather front, okay? Mm. Yeah. And in that front, Sometimes you're going to get positron. If there was an antimatter galaxy and a matter galaxy, you'd get annihilations in that front because the antiprotons would meet up with a proton and a positron would meet up with an anti, uh, an electron, and they would annihilate. And when a positron and an electron annihilate, they make a very characteristic. They turn into energy, but that energy is in the form of X-rays, what are called. And those X-rays have a very characteristic, um, a very characteristic energy of 511 keV. And so we can look out there in the world and look for 511 keV, and we certainly see 511 keV radiation out there, but we don't see enough. We see very, very little. So the betting is that for some reason or other, there, there's just very, very little antimatter out there in the universe, and that brings up the question is, is, is why? Why didn't the, the Big Bang create a lot of antimatter? Because it should have created just as much matter as antimatter. So there's two ways of thinking about it. Maybe, maybe it just created matter and no antimatter. And that, that's but probably unlikely. Because so, we do see antimatter now. So where if it only, if the Big Bang only created matter, then where would antimatter have come from? So well, we could, but we can make antimatter. Remember when when right. a cosmic ray comes and hits a nucleus, it makes these positrons that Anderson. Um, right. Right. Okay. Okay. So we can make antimatter. So that's not the that's not probably what happened. What probably happened, or possibly happened, is. 
that the big band made a million and one matter particles and a million matter antimatter particles. And in fact, there was an enormous amount of annihilation. But since it made just slightly more of one than the other, we, that matter got left over. And right. that formed what we, what we are today. Okay? And the numbers are, are not a million and one to a million. They're more like a trillion or who knows what they are. But, you know, a huge, huge, huge excess of one. Uh, I, I mean, huge, huge number with a very, very tiny excess. Okay? Yeah. So, um, but nobody really knows. This is still, this is, this is one of the grand questions in, in physics. And since physicists are arrogant, any grand question in physics has to be a grand question in science, right? <laughs> of so, course, of course, yeah. Uh, this, is, this is one of the truly grand questions about, about the universe and how we came to be there is where did all the antimatter go? Now, there are some theories. I mean, people have ideas. And there are even some known ways that you can produce just a little bit more ant matter than antimatter. But none of these theories and none of these known ways are sufficient. The, 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 they're just not sufficient mm -hmm. to account for what we observe. And by a lot. It's not a, it's not a well, anyway, the, I should say the known ways of creating these asymmetries, as physicists would call it, asymmetries between making more matter than antimatter. It's just not enough. And as for the theories, well, you know, the people who make the theories believe in them, perhaps. And probably not, okay. actually. The people that make the theories, you know, this is what a good, a good physicist scientist does. They, they think about ideas and they propose ideas. And... They can list an idea even if it, they're not sure about if it's really true. It's worth thinking about. But none of these theories are, are generally accepted. Right. So, right. And then now the idea is to figure out what theories make predictions that can be tested and can actually be investigated to find out how, if they're worth their salt. Well, that's certainly one of, one of the things that people would like to do. But people can also try and make tests that are kind of independent mm -hmm. of any theory. And in some ways, I, you know, th these are two different strategies and they both have advantages. Right. If you have a theory, you know where to look, right? If you have a prediction, you can look for something, what this theory says, and you've got a direction and a goal and you know how to look and it's a much more directed search. Right. Or you can just look for differences without any theory. And what I do working with antihydrogen is more on the latter. We, we don't have precisely a theory that would explain to us exactly what we're looking for. But by studying the properties of antimatter, in particular antihydrogen atoms, what we're hoping is that we can just find a difference. And if we were ever so successful as to find a difference then immediately all the theorists, all the theorists in the world would start working on our problem and solve the right. answer. So I'm sure there'd be a hundred answers in a week later after we had figured out, if we noticed a difference, there'd be a hundred answers the next week about how this difference came about. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, in terms of, you said you're using anti-hydrogen. Why are you trapping anti-hydrogen as opposed to um, an anti-proton or a positron or, you know, something smaller? Well, people, people actually have trapped positrons and anti-protons. And we, we do that um, routinely in our experiment because those are necessary constituents to make anti-hydrogen. As a matter of fact, let me just check something on the web. You guys won't be able to see this, but um, I think this is uh, – I'm just checking what we're doing on the experiment. I have a web page that I'm staring at at the moment. And, and it, get, it lets you know results in real time? <laughs> yeah, I can spy on what they're doing over there at CERN because all of these experiments take place at, at the CERN Physics Laboratory in Geneva, Switzerland. They have to take place there because CERN is the only place in the world 
where we can get an intense source of slow antiprotons. There are other sources of antiprotons. In fact, Fermilab has, which is in Chicago, has, has generates more antiprotons than CERN does, but they're too mm -hmm. energetic for us to use. So we have to go over there. And um, so just at the moment, um, yeah, we're catching antiprotons just at the moment inside of our experiment and positrons as well. Uh, so people have done that and uh, there have been some very nice measurements made on antiprotons. Uh, there are two, we don't particularly do this, uh, but um, there are other some of the other research groups, the ATRAP research group and the Azacusa research group at CERN, both are trying to study the properties of antiprotons by themselves. Mm -hmm. And obviously they're also looking for difference be differences between protons and antiprotons. And there's been quite a bit of work done on positrons, looking to see how positrons behave. And uh, one might be able to find the answer there to this big mystery about antimatter and matter. But antihydrogen is a, is a more complicated system and therefore exhibits a, a much richer range of phenomenon that you can go and study than you can study in a single antiproton or a single positron. Mm -hmm. And remember, we're the sort of uh, elephant stomping around in the room. We don't have a clue. We're just looking for something. Right. At, by looking in a complicated system, it's more likely that we'll see something than if we right. were to look in a very simple system. Okay, that so, makes sense. For the, the system that you're using, within the last year, you've, um, you've at, at the Alpha team has successfully trapped antihydrogen has and and reported trapping it for upwards of uh, 15 minutes was that the right for, about right for a thousand seconds right okay um, we trapped the antihydrogen so um since about 2002 people have been making antihydrogen atoms and basically the way you make antihydrogen atoms is you take a bunch of positrons and you put it in one of these traps. Remember this trap can't have any material walls, right? Because then mm -hmm. the positrons would annihilate. But we put anti we put positrons in a trap and we put antiprotons in a trap like this, okay? And we basically tip the antiprotons into the positron cloud. And when we tip them through, the positrons run back and forth and every now and then one of them gets close enough to an antiproton to form an antihydrogen atom. And every time we do this tipping experiment, we typically make on the order of 10, 15,000 antihydrogen atoms. And all together, since people started being able to do this back in 2002, and we're not the only group that does this, the ATRAP group does this as well, but between ATRAP my experiment alpha and the predecessor to my experiment, which was an experiment named um, uh, Athena, altogether some tens of millions of antihydrogen atoms have been made. But as soon as they were made, they were, they annihilated. And the reason for right. that, that, they were made in traps that used electric fields as well as magnetic fields to confine the antiparticles in one place. And once you, uh, positrons and antiprotons are charged, right? Yeah. And once you, once you um, make an antihydrogen atom, it's no longer charged. So it's no longer going to feel an electric field. And these traps relied on these electric fields. And also, it's not going to feel the magnetic fields in the same way either. So as soon as these antihydrogen was, atoms were made, within say 10 microseconds, 10 millionths of a second or so, they just left the system, hit the trap wall, and what did they do there? They annihilate. Annihilate. <laughs> so what we had to do was to figure out a new type of bottle, which would work for the antihydrogen, the neutral antihydrogen. And in particular, we had to figure out a type of bottle 
which would trap antihydrogen, which was compatible with the types of bottles that we were using to trap the positrons and the antiprotons. Because if you make a bottle that, that works for the antihydrogen atoms, but it destroys the confinement of the positrons and the antiprotons, then you're not going to be making any antihydrogen in the first place, right? Right. So there's going to be nothing to trap. So you have to make a neutral trap and a charged particle trap which are compatible with each other. And that's, that's really, really tough to do. Yeah, that sounds and, and, like that would be the challenge. Yeah, that, that was a challenge. But there's an even bigger challenge perhaps, which is, you know the games where you have a little little ball, a little steel ball, and you roll it around in something which has a few dimples in it, and you have to get the dimples to fall into those holes? Yeah. Okay, so it's hard, right? Because the hole isn't very deep. And so unless you get it to go in directly in, it doesn't fall in. And if it's moving too fast, it falls in, but pops right back out on the other side. Yeah. So our biggest challenge was that our trap for neutral antihydrogen atoms was like one of these little dimples. It's really, really shallow. And so we would make some antihydrogen and we'd actually make it in the dimple to be precise. So this analogy isn't perfect, but it would be moving so fast that it would just roll right out of the trap and hit the wall and annihilate. So what we had to do was to learn to make an antihydrogen atom, which was moving really, really slowly. Hmm. And we're by, by no means perfect at this. So on a good day, when the experiment is running well, we make, in one of these cycles in which we tip the antiprotons into the positron, we make, say, 10,000 antihydrogen atoms. And on a good day, we make one of them, which is moving slowly enough so that it stays inside the dimple and gets trapped in our trap. But once it's in the trap, it seems to stay there for quite some time. It's not that we lost the particle at a thousand seconds. That was the longest we trapped them for. The fact is, at the moment, we don't yet have a way of telling if there's anything in our trap. Okay? We can have a bottle, and it can have stuff in it, but we can't tell. How do we tell that there was something in the trap? We open the bottle and let right, the antenna so you have fly out. Right. And then we get an annihilation and that we can detect. And so the longest that we kept the bottle closed for was a thousand seconds. <laughs> it's really kind of boring, actually. You know, you, <laughs> mix your, you mix everything together and then you can go out for coffee. And th these are Europeans. A lot of them are Europeans. So a lot of coffee drinking gets done. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> so you wander over to the cafeteria, you get your coffee, and then you wander back in, and then you push a button, or actually it's all pre-programmed, but we'll pretend you push a button. That opens opens the trap up, and, and you see what's there. So a 1,000 seconds, that's tolerable, but uh, 2,000 seconds, it's too long. We don't have the patience. <laughs> so at some point, somebody will just... Press the button, open the trap after you know after a long weekend, and see if something comes out. That that that's right. So all right, to tell you the truth, we did try two thousand seconds mm -hmm. a couple of times, once or twice, I think, and we didn't see anything. Okay. Um, so we don't know if that was statistics or if we we're actually losing them after two thousand seconds. But it doesn't matter mm -hmm. because a thousand seconds is forever in physics terms. We can do all the experiments that we want to do in a thousand seconds. Uh, right. What, so, so what kind of uh, you have the the antihydrogen trapped in in the in your bottle? Um, you know, can, what kind of experiments? What kind of things do you want to find out about the properties of antihydrogen? Well, the, the most important property that we want to to um, here, you know, I, I was telling you they're running the experiment at the moment. One of the guys over there running the experiment is, is trying to Skype me just as I'm Skype you just at this moment. Okay. And I'm, I'm, I'm obviously much happier to talk to you than to take so I'm ignoring him. <laughs> anyway, um, so the properties that we want to look, look at is the color. 
that antihydrogen glows at. All atoms glow with characteristic colors. You've all you've seen this in in, in the neon bulbs, right? In in the in the beer signs and the in the bars, they all have different colors. Right. You can have and pink or blue or whatever, depending on the gas that's inside. Green, exactly. It depends on the gas and. Um, so this color is really, really characteristic of uh, the atom and the properties of the atom that are inside. Mm -hmm. And anti hydrogen and antihydrogen, undoubtedly, but hydrogen, we know it glows. It glows with a specific color. It happens we can't see this color. It's, a, it's an ultraviolet color. Um, so we can't see it, but we can certainly detect it with instruments. Right. And what we would like to do is to see if um, to see if antihydrogen glows with the same color as hydrogen. And it may sound strange, but detecting the color with which something glows is one of the things that scientists can do better than almost anything else. So in mm -hmm. principle, Nobody's quite done this with hydrogen yet, but we know what the theoretical limits are, and they're they're pretty they're they're in striking distance of the theoretical limits. In in principle, we can tell the color, or the technical term would be the wavelength, but never mind. Let's call it the color. We can tell the color that hydrogen glows to to a precision that's equal to a one followed by eighteen zeros, hmm. which is really astonishing you know t t let me give you an analogy to this okay and you would ask me beforehand if i if you were allowed to bring up angels and demons so let's bring up angels and demons so right. that was a movie that you may know your audience may know um concerned using anti-hydrogen to destroy the vatican a very very silly movie and a very <laughs> very silly book but um <laughs> but in this book they have something like uh they're going to use a quarter of a gram of antihydrogen to blow up the Vatican. And, and that's actually realistic. If you had a quarter of a gram of antihydrogen, which you're never going to have, so we needn't worry about this, but if you had a quarter of a gram, it, it, it would make an explosion that could um, destroy the Vatican, okay? Right. But a quarter of a gram of antihydrogen, uh, of, of hydrogen, uh, what, how big is a quarter of a gram? It's a couple of gran, grains of rice, okay? So let's consider some grains of rice and let's, let's stack grains of rice end to end, uniform grains of rice. We have some rice plant that, that you biologists have made so that it's at, they're absolute uniform. So we stack these grains of rice one quarter of the way to the nearest star. All right? Mm -hmm. That takes a lot of grains of rice, as you can imagine. Well... The accuracy and the precision which we can tell colors of hydrogen glowing and hopefully anti-hydrogen color glowing is equivalent to being able to tell that one grain of rice was removed from that stack of grains of rice that went all the way to the nearest star, which, which is just a mind-blowing. Yeah, that's pretty accurate. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty accurate. So what we want to do is to is to see if if uh, if hydrogen and antihydrogen, or one of the things we want to do is to see if hydrogen and antihydrogen glow with exactly the same color. And um, that's one of our principal experiments. An experiment that we'd like to attempt in a few years is to see which way antihydrogen falls. You know, everybody knows that apples are attracted towards Earth. And everybody right. believes that an anti-apple would be attracted towards an anti-Earth. But there are no measurements, no direct measurements, one way or the other, about how an anti-apple would be attracted towards Earth. In fact, there was some speculation that absolutely no one believes. But there was some speculation some years ago that an anti-apple would actually fall upwards rather than downwards. That it would and be repelled by the gravitational field. That that's right, and so people people are trying that. Um, there's a new experiment that's going to come online at CERN called the Aegis experiment, 
they may or may not run this year. They're trying to, they're trying to just start running just a little bit this year. And um, their goal is to look at gravitational interactions. And we're certainly hoping eventually to get to that topic as well. This is just fascinating. We are at the end of our hour, and I just want to thank you so much for joining me today. I know you've got a very busy schedule, and you're, uh, you've got a lot of really interesting research going on at the moment. Um, probably people who want to talk to you from CERN. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much for having you on your program. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm glad. I, it's just been just so interesting to hear the story of, of how the research is moving forward and what you what you're working on, and um, it's definitely a, a story that has it has a lot of chapters still to be written. Well, I, I, certain, I, I certainly hope that there are more chapters to be written. Trapping was trapping is fun, but what we want to do is do the physics measurements and shed some light on this grand question, hopefully about how we yeah. came. To well, I, if you if you if you publish any more papers on those physics experiments, I hope that we'll be able to get you back here on the show to talk about what you find out. So, it's been just fabulous, and thank you, thank you once again. Have a wonderful evening, sure. everybody out there. This has been the Science Hour. I'd like to thank Dr. Joel Fagens for joining us here on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour, and for all the information that he's given us about antimatter. Be sure to visit his website to find out more information. Additionally. Um, if you, you want to hear some more, hear him explain uh, the antimatter trapping story a bit further, uh, there is a video available, um, the Angels and Demons story that is available from a lecture he gave. Um, it's up on YouTube. So go look for that. And there's a lot more stuff to send you on your own antimatter intellectual excursions. I hope that we've set you up for a really good week with this episode of the show. I'm Dr. Kiki. Next week, we're going to be talking about science. We have a guest. It's, it's either going to be batteries or elephants. I don't know which one yet. Show up next week and find out. Until then, you can follow my sciencey pursuits on the internet by going to Google and looking for Dr. Kiki. If you're on Google Plus, just look for Kiki because they won't let me call myself Dr. Kiki on Google Plus. I don't know what's up with that, but Twitter, Facebook, all the others, look for Dr. Kiki. I'm out there. If you want to download past episodes of this program or subscribe to the show, head on over to twit.tv forward slash Kiki and you should find all sorts of ways to access those things for yourself there. I will see you next week. I hope that we have uh, given you a lot to think about. And remember, all I ask is one hour a week. And I do hope that it made your world a whole lot more interesting. Until next time, see you later. Oh, and now for your weekly science meditation. <laughs>